Hi everyone, my name is Daniela Muñoz Granados. I'm a geologist in the US Geological Survey in the Earthquake Science Center. And today I'm very pleased to talk to you about the Indonesian tectonics and some comparable tectonic settings around the world. So let's start with the Indonesian regional tectonics. As uh, a lot of speakers have said in all this set of talks, uh, we have the Sunda Plate, which occupies the most of the land in Indonesia. Uh, this is south of the Eurasian Plate, which uh, this Sunda Plate was formerly considered part of that Eurasian Plate before. Uh, the, we have the Indian Plate, which is subducting underneath the Sunda Plate. Also, the Australian Plate, uh, subducting under the Bandasa region and the Philippine Sea Plate. If we look at the seismology, uh, we can see that the trench, the Su Java Sumatra Trench, is delineated very uh, nicely, let's say, because of that seismicity. We can see an almost ideal Benioff zone that continues uh, until the region of the Banda Sea and kind of bends here. I know some of my colleagues have deepened into this. And why Eastern Indonesia? Well, let's take a close up here. But I want you to see here that the bathymetry, uh, at fir first glance, we can see that is deeper uh, compared to the western part of this map, which in which we have the Banda Sea. And this is because the continental platform here is uh, more buoyant. This makes part of the Sunda Plate. And we have some oceanic floor here in the, especially the South Banda Sea Basin. And of course we have some oceanic lithosphere uh, as a product of, of seafloor spreading. And we have the volcanism that continues into the Banda Sea region and makes a little turn in the Banda Arc. But if we're going to talk about tectonics here in Eastern Indonesia, we have to mention that there's a set of microplates that interact, of course, very complexly here. And I know one of my colleagues have spoken about the Eastern Indonesia tectonics, so I won't deepen into that. And looking again to the earthquakes, uh, we can see that this Timor Trench uh, also marks how the subduction continues here. Uh, it has been discussed a lot if the, continu uh, the um, subduction, if actually the Australian plate subducts underneath the Van de Sea region. And well, at least if we look at the seismicity, it looks like it does. So. If we look very quickly to the tectonic evolution of the of Indonesia, especially East Indonesia, we can see that there's a continental promontory adjacent to Australia, this kind of insular uh, regions that is traveling towards the north and colliding with part of Eurasian other continental fragments. And those conti that, that continental promontory uh, is the Sula Spur, which are Australian blocks that are now situated in Borneo and West Sulawesi and Java. So uh, they are now located in the arrangement of micro plates that we have here very complexly interacting. But now let me talk to you about the circumpacific uh, tectonics and some similar cases. Here in the upper right map we can see the globe. Uh, we can see Southeast Indonesia, sorry, Southeast Asia. And in the lower left map we can see a different projection which is centered in a great circle that goes from Taiwan to the Scotia Arc. I'll be talking about that later. 
Uh, unfortunately, we cannot see the whole Southeast Asian region, but uh, I want to show you just where, it, where it's placed in this map. The, the nice thing about this projection is that we can see the Circum-Pacific Orogenic Belt highlighted in gray. And uh, let's see n some of the regions that I'm going to compare with, in with East Indonesia in the following slides. First, we have the Caribbean Plate. Uh, the Caribbean Plate is located south of North America and north of South America. Then we have the Scotia Plate, south from South America and north from Antarctica. And finally, Alaska. So, uh, before we continue, let's take a small field trip around the Circum Pacific. So, I'll be showing you the places that we're gonna compare with Indonesian tectonics. Here we have the Scotia Plate, north from Antarctica and south from South America. If we continue to the north, we can travel through the Andes and we get into the Caribbean Plate. If we continue going north, we will find that uh, the Alaska Range next to Canada also, the Aleutian Trench, uh, some other seas and, and subduction zones, the Japan Sea, the Philippine Sea. Here's the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest trench in the world. And we finally get to Southeast Asian tectonic setting, which as you can see, is a very complex uh, microplate interaction, especially here, as I already mentioned, in East Indonesia. And let's continue a little bit more towards the north. We almost got into India. And go. let's go back to Antarctica, towards the south, give a little turn to the west, and we finish where we started, in South America, where I come from. And now, since we're in South America, um, let's start speaking about the Caribbean Plate. So the Caribbean Plate is a very oceanic, uh, buoyant plate, uh, plateau, which, um, of course, because of that buoyancy, the adjacent uh, oceanic lithosphere subducts underneath it. For example, we have the Caucasus and the Nazca Plate which subducts uh, in the western margin of the Caribbean plate. And we also have some northern and southern strike slip fault zones uh, boundaries, much more complex because uh, in some segments they are transtensional and in other they are transpressional. Uh, and in the eastern part we have the Lesser Antilles Trench. That in which we also have some Atlantic Oceanic lithosphere subducting. <coughs> and here in the lower right part of the slide, we can see the Eastern Indo Indonesia map. So if we look at the leading edge, let's call it like that, of both uh, tectonic settings, we can see that the Caribbean plate have the Lesser Antilles Volcanic Arc, and here we have the Banda Sea Arc. And uh, uh, the Caribbean Plate has another arc in its trailing edge. However, here in, in East Indonesia, we don't have that uh, feature. That's important to, to, to note. Uh, now, if we look at the seismicity of the Caribbean Plate, we can see that we also have a very some very well-defined plate boundaries, uh, subduction zones especially. Here we find the Middle America Trench and the South American Trench uh, in the western edge. And in the eastern edge, we find the Lesser Antilles Trench. But both of uh, those uh, subduction zones, as I already mentioned, I are the trailing edge and the leading edge of the Caribbean plate. But let me uh, say that the leading edge, of course, as well as the trailing edge, have been evolving through the Caribbean plate tectonic evolution. And I'll explain that later. And of course, I already, uh, as I already told you, we have some complex strike slip tectonic setting in the northern and southern 
edges uh, in the transtensional segments is very common to find pull apart basins. In the northernmost part of the Caribbean, we have the Cayman Trough, and in the southernmost uh, boundary, you have the Falcon and Bonaire basins. And now let's take a small virtual field trip through an overflight here in the Caribbean. Let's start in the northern part of Colombia and Venezuela. Uh, here we see some islands, those are the Leeward Antilles. We see now the Lesser Antilles, uh, the Aves Ridge, some n uh, nice features in the bathymetry, the accretionary prism of the Lesser Antilles. Uh, now let's go towards Puerto Rico and its tecto uh, sorry, its trench, which is one of the deepest trenches in the world. Here the island of Hispaniola, where we have Dominican Republic and Haiti. We can see also Jamaica, the elongated big island of Cuba, uh, the Cayman Trough, uh, the one that I just talked about. And if we leave. If we look a little bit towards the north, we have the Gulf of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula. Now we start looking at Middle America. Now we have Nicaragua around here, the Nicaragua rice, which is an important feature in the bathymetry. And we finally get to Costa Rica and Panama, which in which we have another arc here of volcanoes. And we finish where we started again. Now let me talk about the Caribbean plate origin. Uh, so for the, for the Caribbean plate origin we have two hypotheses. The first one is the in situ origin in which uh, the, the authors, some authors state that the Caribbean plateau, oceanic plateau was created between North and South America after the Pangaea breakup in the Jurassic Triassic times and uh, the other one is the Pacific origin in which we have a buoyant oceanic plateau that is created due to interplate volcanism in originated by a hotspot located in the Pacific that hotspot hotspot creates a large igneous province which we call the Caribbean large igneous province and because of the buoyancy of that oceanic plateau uh, that starts in the Pacific, uh, it starts developing a leading edge and a trailing edge, which both uh, have some interoceanic volcanic arcs. And those arcs collide with both North and South America. Um, that's what we call the leading edge and as I already told you it evolves through time and starts colliding and in most of the cases accreting to those continental plates located in the north and south. So if we take a closer look to that leading edge uh, evolution leading edge, sorry, I, this is not trailing, it's leading. Um, we can see that how the oceanic plateau drifted towards the east. And this yellow line shows us how that leading edge evolved through time since the lower Cretaceous, then upper Cretaceous, all the way until the Miocene, and to finally get to where the Lesser Antilles Trench is located today. Uh, of course, here we have an uh, arc continent collision and also the arc of the trailing edge, which is the, let's say, back part of the Caribbean plateau traveling towards the east, also collides with these two continents. This came come to be uh, the Panama and Costa Rica arc. And if we take a, a schematic uh, view of how this evolved since that mantle plume that I already told you, of course, assuming we're talking about the Pacific 
origin of the Caribbean plate. Uh, we can see that we have some plume magmatism here in the early Cretaceous. It starts going up, so it's uh, so the plume head starts creating some basaltic volcanism in the lithosphere. And in the late Cretaceous, since the, that lithosphere get thickened and more buoyant, uh, we can start talking about a lip, a large igneous province, we're, which we call the Caribbean Large Igneous Province. And there is some subduction initiation along its uh, edges because the ancient fragile plate is more dense, so it starts sinking and eventually starts subducting underneath that new buoyant oceanic plateau. This is one model that exists. Of course, they, they, there are some other different models, but the idea of the Caribbean plate origin uh, involves the mantle plume or located in the Pacific, and this is just one way to explain it. This model was proposed by Waram and Stern. So now let's talk about the Scotia Plate. The Scotia Plate is located south of South America. Uh, let's look at, at first glance. It looks uh, very similar to the Caribbean. However, if we focus in the bathymetry, for example, we can see that uh, the, all of this area is submerged in the Scotia Plate, under the water, today at least. In the Caribbean Plate, uh, there's, a, there's a region of land uplifted in the back part, let's say, of the Caribbean. In the Scotia Sea, we cannot see that. However, the leading edge uh, looks very similar. Here we have the South Sandwich uh, Islands very similar to the Lesser Antilles, also with active volcanism. And that subduction zone is also outlined by the seismicity. As well as the Caribbean Plate, its northern and southern boundaries are strike leaps, uh, strike sleep faults. But the western part of the Scotia Plate is very different from the Caribbean. It doesn't have current active volcanism and well-developed subduction. Actually, this is not clear uh, if, if there's subduction here and strikes lip faulting. Now, if we look at the Scotia Plate evolution, we will see that uh, there are some oceanic ridges developing between so South America and Antarctica. This is a reconstruction made with fixed South America. And we can see that there's a continuous continental connection between South America and uh, Antarctica at the beginning of this reconstruction, which starts 40 million years ago. Unfortunately, we cannot see here the age, but here's the reference if you want to look at that model. And those continental fragments start like spreading uh, outwards or eastwards uh, and start forming what today we can see as the trailing edge and then developing the Scotia Arc as we see it today. So it's clearly different from the Caribbean plate evolution, which is motivated, let's say, uh, by a buoyant oceanic plateau uh, originated by a mantle plume in the Pacific and going towards the east with respect to South America. However, we can uh, compare those two cases to understand the origin of both the Caribbean and the Scotia Plate. Now, uh, let's look at Alaska. Here we have a trench uh, in which there's subduction until some point and another volcanic arc here, but as you can see, this is sub-parallel to the trench. And you, we can notice that there is a distance change between the arc and the trench. It looks shorter in the west and uh, larger, la larger in the east. And the reason of this is that the fore arc is, is changing uh, 
as a function of how steep or shallow the Pacific plate is subducting underneath the Alaska region. Also because the rate of, of subduction changes here in the west, it goes from fast he around here to slow around here. And the evolution that we will see here is that the, cur the Pacific plate going towards the north uh, have some buoyant plateau that starts accreting in the edge and creating maybe some uh, deformation in some mountains because it resists to subduct. So if we look at the Alaska evolution, this is an animation uh, that you can find in YouTube, we can see that there's a oceanic terrain tra traveling towards the north and accreting to the edge of North America. That is the Rangelia terrain. Let's take a quick look again. So we can see the Rangelia terrain going towards the north and accreting around the Lake Cretaceous. So that's the situation that we see here in this schematic cross section. Uh, that's where we have an island arc continent collision. Now, if we look uh, more closer in time, we will we can focus in the Yakutat terrain, which is a small continent fragment that is traveling towards the north 20 million years ago and accreting to the North American margin. And since uh, part of it resists to subduct, it starts um, deformating the continental plate and creating some high mountain ranges as well as some other cases that exist and are very famous. Some authors call this scape or indenter tectonics. The most famous case of this kind of tectonics is the India and Eurasia collision in which India travels northwards, collides with Eurasia and since it resists to subduct it creates some high mountains that are now the Himalayas. Here we have a small scale uh, example of that. So we have the Yakutat block, which is continental, but much smaller than India, of course. Uh, it resists to subduct in some point, and because of that, we have some uh, flow, let's say, of the adjacent uh, continental region in this case is counterclockwise and because of that we also have some trench retreat in this case the Aleutian Trench we can compare this case actually with the Java Sumatra Trench uh, which in the northern part is creating some oceanic spreading center and a new ocean there so uh, here in this map we see uh, the most famous case I already told you here we have India, a continental plate that traveled uh, towards the north and collided with Eurasia. It forms the Himalayas. And in today's uh, vector, GPS vectors, we can see that the independent uh, continental blocks move kind of like escaping from that collision of India. And here in the in the southern part of this map, we can see that we start having some of the region of Indonesia. So that's why I want to compare this case with this. And actually, uh, as I already told you, we have this trench retreat and it develops also here very uh, similarly. And in this region, we also have some spreading, oceanic spreading in northwestern Indonesia. Now let's make a summary of wha what we have mentioned in this talk. Uh, we have made some comparisons and find some similarities with some regions around the world. One of them is the Caribbean plate, the other is the Scotia plate, and finally we have the Alaska region. But if we look at East Indonesia, we can see that it looks very similar to the Caribbean plate. Uh, in terms of 
that there's oceanic arc and continent, coll continent collisions in both of them. In this case, we have uh, the leading edge of the Caribbean plate colliding with both South America and North America. And here we have the Banda arc uh, bending and being affected by uh, collisions between both continental plates and some other microplates that are both oceanic and continental. Uh, this is a more complex tectonic arrangement, but but I want to say here is that maybe in the future, the East Indonesia in the Bandasi region um, might look a little similar to how the Caribbean looks today. Uh, and uh, we have also compared it to the Scotia Plate, in which we have some continental fragments that were, were rifted and transported after South America and Antarctica separated. It created some oceanic crust uh, be in between them and because of the relative movement of South America towards the Pacific, uh, if, we, if we look at the Scotia Plate movement, we can see that it goes eastward with respect to stable South America, as well as uh, the Banda Arc goes eastward re with respect to Eurasia. And we also have here the trailing edge with the volcanic arc. However, uh, I want to mention that in the Scotia Plate, uh, in the back part, let's say, of the Scotia Plate, uh, it has the, the Pacific Oceanic Plateau still uh, related with it, as well as we have the continental uh, plateau of the Sunda Plate, still kind of uh, closely related to the Banda Sea region, different from the Caribbean, the, which is already independent from the Pacific Plates that are west of the Caribbean Plate. Finally, we can see that in the northwest Indonesia, there's a similarity with the Alaska region, because we have continent-continent collision. Uh, this is called escape tectonics by some authors. But however, in Alaska, uh, it's happening in a much smaller scale than it happened in with India and Eurasia. But uh, since, since Indonesia is located here, uh, of course, the northwestern part of it is affected by this escape tectonics. Uh, so here we have a similarity of India res resisting to subduct and Eurasia uh, being deformed outwards, let's say, of that collision. And this trench retreat that I mentioned before that is uh, manifested here in Alaska is also seen and even more developed here in the Java Trench. Actually, we can see some oceanic floor spreading adjacent to that trench. So, to finish with this talk, uh, I want to say that the common factor among all of these cases that I've talked about is that they are accretionary origins. Uh, they develop as a, a result of accretion of terrains. They are all located in the circumpacific orogenic belt and they are all uh, mainly constructed during Cenozoic to Mesozoic times. I finish here with this nice uh, landscape of two volcanoes located in East Java, Indonesia. Those are the Bromo and Semeru volcanoes. And thanks for listening and hope you learned a lot with this.